In the name of Jesus, amen. Maybe you noticed that today's reading from Luke started out, there will be signs. That's caused me to this week to be thinking a lot about signs. I thought about road signs particularly, signs that give us an idea of what's ahead or how much further we have to travel or what we need to do to get there. As I thought about it, I thought the sign that best captured the message of this first Sunday in Advent would likely be a sign that they often put up where, in a place where there have been a lot of automobile accidents. Dangerous intersection. We might say it's a heads up, a warning sign for the driver who's approaching to be alert and take care. It seems to me this first Sunday in Advent 2018 is a kind of dangerous intersection. Think about it. Christmas decorations are up all over town. Our newspapers and mailboxes are stuffed with ads trying to convince us that somebody we know would like this or that for Christmas. People are scurrying around to schedule their parties, send their greetings, bake their cookies, plan their family visits, and do whatever other things are part of the season for them. So maybe this morning, you're coming from that direction, full of all those activities and expectations of the Christmas season. And from another direction come the heavy hearts that some people have at this time of year. They may be dwelling with, dealing with some tragedy or trauma in their lives. Or they may be thinking about losses that they have suffered, hopes that are unrealized, traditions that won't be quite the same. They might be remembering the people who won't be part of the celebrations because of distance or divorce or death. Maybe a bit of you comes from that direction with sadness and disappointments and griefs that are part of this season for so many. From still another direction comes all the happenings in our world these days. The daily headlines and the news feeds on our computers sound a little bit like what Jesus described in our gospel reading. Distress among nations, people fainting from fear and foreboding. I don't need to list all of those things to you. You hear about them every day. And maybe you've come down that road this morning with the happenings of the world on your mind. From whatever direction or directions you might be coming this morning, the signs tell us that we are approaching a potentially dangerous intersection. All these things intersecting might be enough to cause us to ask whether the world is coming to an end or maybe some days to wish it would. God's people have known about dangerous intersections for generations, and God has always given them signs of warning and hope. The three texts that we heard this morning give us a glimpse of several pieces of that story. The people of Jeremiah's day had experienced unimaginable loss. Their land had been taken over by a foreign power. The center of their religious life was desecrated, and they themselves had been carried off into exile in a strange land. They wondered if God had abandoned them. And the Christians at Thessalonica were being persecuted and they were separated from their teacher and mentor. And they sometimes must have felt like giving up 
on God or on one another. And the people in the temple that day listening to Jesus must have felt the rumblings, the political unrest, the social tensions, the religious upheaval that all intersected in that holy week in the last days before Jesus' arrest and execution. And those people who first read Luke's gospel, they would have experienced the distress of the first century Jewish-Roman wars. They would have seen the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, the very place that they counted on to assure them of God's presence with them. And they would have been waiting, expecting Jesus to return any day now for 70 or 80 years. They knew about dangerous intersections. Those dangerous intersections for them and for us are fraught with temptations. Jesus' words tell us about some of those dangerous temptations. Having hearts that are weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. I don't know about you, but I don't use the word dissipation just every day. <clears throat> but I think many of us know what it feels like. Dissipation is to be scattered, to be disintegrated, to be crumbled to be spread too thin. We are dissipated when we try to do too many things at the same time in too many places. And it's what happens when we think that we are somehow in charge of holding together this crumbling world, or at least our little corner of it. Now, drunkenness probably doesn't need quite as much explanation as dissipation. Drunkenness is a weight of opting out, of not taking responsibility. Abuse of alcohol and drugs are not the only way to be drunken. We can do it in lots of other ways. We close ourselves off, shut reality out, act irresponsible. Drunkenness, in all of its manifestations, happens when we think that what we do doesn't matter. Either because of despair, where we think no one is in charge, and things are so bad we probably couldn't make a difference anyway, or because we hold some sort of false hope, seeing God like a magician who will make everything all right no matter what damage we do. And being weighed down with the worries of this life, most of us don't have to think very long to begin to name the things we worry about, ourselves, the people we love, our congregations and communities, our country, our world, the economy, the environment, there are lots of things to worry about. We worry when we want to hang on to the things of this life. We worry when we fear that there won't be enough. Money, time, love, energy, resources. We worry when we don't believe that God will ultimately get it right. And when we're weighed down, with dissipation and drunkenness and worry and fear. The intersection of the things in our life become especially dangerous. We can become so focused inward, so preoccupied with our own circumstances, so taken with our own illusions and perceptions that we miss what is really going on. So Advent comes for us like a wake-up call. It's an opportunity to slow down, to pay attention, to take care so that we don't miss the warning signs or the signs of hope that God gives us these days. That's the opportunity we have this morning 
and that we have in the weeks between now and Christmas Eve. It's an opportunity to be countercultural, not to jump over Advent directly to Christmas, and not to be a bah humbug kind of person, but to watch and pray, to listen and learn what it is that God would have us know and learn in these weeks. What we notice is that the, that the end times our text talks about begin with a sign, one that we know well, you probably, like me, have it memorized. It was proclaimed by the angels to the shepherds. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The coming of that baby is only the beginning of a cosmic birthing process a process that will finally end only when the Son of Man comes in a cloud with power and great glory, a process in which heaven and earth as we know it will be no more, a process in which the kingdom of God is being born. Something new is happening. It's a sign. The people in Jerusalem who heard Jesus that day, the persecuted Christians in Thessalonica who received Paul's letter, and the people gathered here in Valparaiso today can feel the birth pangs. And it can be unsettling, disorienting, and fear-producing. And the automatic response is to hunker down, to cover our heads, to find some safe place to hide. But Jesus calls us to something else. Stand up. Raise your heads, he says. Face it head on. There's really nothing to fear. As surely as the leaves budding on the tree is a sign that summer is soon to come, so surely these signs these things are a sign that the kingdom of God is here, that your redemption is drawing near. So fear not. Have hope. The same rumbling contractions that birthed the baby quake the earth at Good Friday and split open the tomb on Easter. It's the same movement that makes waves in the baptismal font drowning sin and creating new life. It's the same thing that breaks open our hearts to confess our sin and receive God's extravagant love and enduring forgiveness. It's the same force that blows in the Holy Spirit and disturbs our complacency and calls us to action to service, to be signs of God's reign in the world. Lift up your heads. This is a good place to do it because when we look up, we see the cross. It is a sign, a reminder if we take time to notice. It's a reminder of all the things that Jesus wants us to know this morning. Heaven and earth will pass away. But this much is sure. God's promises are for sure. The kingdom of God, the reign of Christ is here, and we're part of it, no matter what might intersect with our lives. In Christ, God makes a path through the most dangerous intersections, and God is present with us all the way to the end. When we lift up our heads, we see if we take time to notice another sign that God gives us this day. Here at the table, in bread and wine, the real presence of Christ for us to take in and carry with us. You know, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? That God entrusts this new life 
into our frail hands. That God asks us to carry that gift into the world, to take the hope and the promise to those who are fearful, to those who feel that their world is ending, to those whose hearts are weighed down. One of the things that happens when we stand up and lift our heads is that we see our neighbors. We see their needs and the opportunities we have to help the kingdom be born in them. When we stand up and lift our heads, we also see our neighbor's faith. Just look around at all these people who have faith that encourages and nurtures our own, especially in our trying times. Our sisters and brothers in the faith who give us joy and for whom we thank God. You've heard that I'm here to be the preacher this morning because it's LDA Sunday. And I'm required to do this now. <laughs> it's a time to give thanks for the Lutheran Diaconal Association. And a time for the LDA to say thank you to you for your partnership and support. Over here is a little covey of deaconesses and deacons and, and diaconal students. I don't think there are any more in the congregation today. We had a few scattered around in other places at the early service. But I want to tell you that we're people who've been called by God and formed in diakonia, that Greek word, and set apart to be part of the diaconate, the company of deaconesses and deacons, so that we can serve in the church and world. And part of our service is to be a sign, a reminder among God's people that God calls all of us, every baptized person of whatever age and with whatever gifts, to follow the servant Christ into service in the world. Another part of our service is to name diakonia, service in Christ, wherever we see it. So we're here to name it this morning among you in what you do in church, in community, in this congregation, in your families, in neighborhoods, in your jobs, and your daily vocation. Today, the LDA is holding up one example a sign of diakonia in your midst, in the person of Ed Sykowski. And you'll hear more about that a little later. But for now, I leave you with this. Especially this Advent, stand up, lift your heads, notice the signs especially the one that was marked on our foreheads at our baptism. The sign of the cross that will never pass away. The sign that we are God's beloved daughters and sons in whom God delights. The sign that we are all entrusted with every bit of God's love and hope for sharing with one another and with the world. So we encourage one another and go out a little more lighthearted and abounding in love. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs>